Welcome, welcome, welcome on this cold and snowy day here in New York anyway. We envy those who are joining us from California because they have better weather, but we're grateful we're not in Texas uh, where we can't even imagine how they're enduring this, uh, this, this effect of climate change, of deregulation and of so many things. But we're so grateful that all of you are here. For those of you I don't know, I'm Linda Longmire. I'm a professor of global studies and geography department, and also one of the co-directors of the international scene lecture series, which is part of our Institute for Policy Studies, which is part of the Center for Civic Engagement. So we're delighted that all of you are here. We're also particularly grateful as always for the help of the Cultural Center, which is responsible for such a wide array of wonderful programs. And in fact, before we begin today, I wanna to just alert several of you who may not know about other things, two other things coming up that I think might be of interest. One is on Thursday, February 25th, um, there will be a program, an interesting program on QAnon, the Capitol insurrection and the Biden inauguration um, that will be interesting, obviously. Um, that's at 420 and you should check the Cultural Center catalog uh, to uh, schedule to see um, details about how to register and whatnot. Tuesday, March 2nd, we have an interesting event trust in a polarized age uh, with Dr. Kevin Vallier, who, um, and again, that will be, I think, wide appeal, great interest. So again, um, RSVP to the Cultural Center. We are delighted to welcome, of course, our class, our um, global studies, uh, or sorry, our uh, introduction to peace and conflict studies course, who are joining us today, as well as uh, an alert that this course will be offered again next fall. So please join us for a continuation of these important issues and discussions. Uh, those of you who are students, we would love to, to see you there. And um, I am excited today, particularly excited, to welcome back to Hofstra, uh, Dr. Trita Parsi, who has been here before, so we're so grateful that he's returned some of you are very familiar with his important work. He's obviously an expert on a wide variety of foreign policy issues and uh, is an award-winning author. Um, his first book uh, won an award from the Foreign Policy Institute, I believe. And it was called, and I'm giving you these because those of you who may want to explore these issues further will find them invaluable. Treacherous Alliance, the Secret Dealings of Iran, Israel, and the United States, which again won a Council on Foreign Relations Award. Uh, his second book was called A Single Roll of the Dice, Obama's Diplomacy with Iran, and that again was award-winning. And his most recent book is, of course, on the, um, the Iran deal, um, Losing an Enemy, Obama, Iran, and the Triumph of Diplomacy, which gives you the real behind the scenes story of the Iran deal. Uh, and today, of course, that brings us right up to uh, his analysis of the Biden administration and what it's going to mean in terms of nuclear policy and the nuclear deal with Iran. But he also, I wanted to mention, is uh, executive vice president of the Quincy Institute from whence he is joining us today. Uh, the Quincy Institute for Reasonable or Responsible Statecraft, Have We Ever Needed It More? And, uh, and his course is an important consultant at the UN on a variety of, of critical foreign policy issues, including human rights issues. So I do hope some of my human rights class is joining us today too. In any case, we are most delighted that he's here. And uh, the format for today will be that he'll speak for 25, 30 minutes. And then as always, we will open things up for your questions, comments, reactions, uh, because of course these issues are, are so importantly discussed in dialogue. And, um, and with those issues, we will give first priority to students, of course, since they are paying the big tuition dollars for their education. And, uh, and then we'll open up to the broader community. But we are so delighted that all of you have joined us today. And please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Trita Parsi. We are delighted to welcome you back to Hofstra. Thank you so much. It's a great, great pleasure 
to be with you all, uh, sadly, over Zoom. Uh, the previous times I've been there in person, it's always been a great pleasure uh, to visit your beautiful campus. Uh, hopefully, this will also be the last time we do this on Zoom. Hopefully, also, it will be the last time we talk about an Iran crisis. Uh, hopefully, this will get resolved and we can talk about other things. But I do want to talk about the, the situation with Iran under the Biden administration. I want to give a bit of a background of what has happened in the last couple of years, because it's obviously extremely important for understanding the choices and to a certain extent, the lack of choices that the Biden administration uh, is faced with. Uh, as part of the background, as all of you probably know, in 2015, the Obama administration struck a historic nuclear deal with Iran negotiated together with the P5 plus one, which are, is the five permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany. Uh, these were extensive negotiations. I mean, the actual full length of all of the negotiations on the nuclear front was 12 years or actually 13 years uh, until they came to this conclusion. And in many ways, um, part of the reason I think it's valid to call it historic is because there's not a lot of other examples in history in which a major international dispute that is on the verge of war is resolved peacefully through diplomacy before a single shot even is fired and through a major compromise from both sides. Usually what we see is that war takes place and then diplomacy comes afterwards to clean up the mess essentially. This one we had an example of a major issue. We're talking about all the great powers involved. We're talking about it being on the verge of war um, that would have been a global war. It would not just have been a war between two countries bordering each other. And it was managed to be resolved diplomatically through these extensive negotiations. At the core of it, this deal uh, essentially prevented or prohibited uh, all paths that Iran had at its disposal to build a nuclear weapon. Those paths were closed off uh, because of a combination of restrictions and inspections that was put on the Iranian program. From the Iranian side, however, it was also a win for them, which is part of the reason why this is a, a deal that can survive because everyone felt that they get something through the deal. And it's only under those circumstances that a deal actually would be sustainable. If, if a deal is completely one-sided, one side gets everything, the other side feels completely robbed, rest assured within a short period of time, conflict is going to erupt again. In order to get a sustainable deal, you need to make sure that everyone feels a winner. From the US side, the win was to make sure that the Iranians could not build nuclear weapons. It was also a win that we could avoid a war. From the Iranian side, the win was that on the one hand, war was evaded, sanctions were supposed to be lifted. They didn't end up getting lifted the way that it was planned, but also it put an end to Iran's political and economic isolation. Iran was essentially de facto recognized as a major power in the region that had to be dealt with, spoken to, rather than thinking that by simply isolating it politically and economically, um, uh, the region or the United States would be able to get its way with the Iranians. That was the win that made this deal possible. Um, when the deal was struck and it was starting to be implemented, already then we did see that the sanctions relief that the United States was supposed to do had some challenges, which to a large extent is a result of the fact that the US is actually very good at imposing sanctions. We have very little experience when it comes to lifting sanctions. So lifting the sanctions is a and is an expertise that was not what the people in the US Treasury and OFAC necessarily possess. Um, imposing sanctions and figuring out new ways of doing it uh, is, is a completely different skill that the United States has become quite good at. But that was not the main problem. The main problem that occurred is that when Donald Trump got elected, he decided early on or even during the campaign that this was gonna be one of the legacies of the Obama administration that he simply wanted to erase and move towards it with almost an obsession, an obsession because of the fact that he was willing to sacrifice so many other US interests, so many other US relations in the world in order to be able to get out of the deal. And nevertheless, it took a year from him to get out of the deal for a very simple reason. 
the first line of people that he got hired to be at the State Department, at the Defense Department, all advised against leaving the deal because of the disastrous consequences it would have for the region and for the United States. So General Mattis was against it, Rex Tillerson was against it, H.R. McMaster was uh, against it. It took essentially to the point in which he replaced more or less all of these people. And he was surrounding himself with people who uh, either would say whatever uh, Trump wanted to hear or who had their own interest in undoing the nuclear deal because they had for decades advocated for a war between the United States and Iran. Uh, John Bolton is in that category. Mike Pompeo uh, and others were perhaps more in the category of them just wanting to advance their own interest and doing whatever Trump was saying. So in 2018, in May of that year, the United States walks out of the deal. The Europeans are tremendously um, um, uh, upset about this decision. So are the Russians and the Chinese. The Iranians are frankly shocked because after a year of Trump still being in the deal, it was almost as if the Iranians had um, been left with the impression that Trump is just gonna talk about leaving the deal, but he's actually not gonna do anything. It took nevertheless a full year before the Iranians started to utilize an article in the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, Article 36, that allows Iran to reduce its obligations under the deal if other states have reduced their obligations or left the deal. And the US had completely left the deal. So the Iranians started to stockpile more enriched uranium, um, uh, use more advanced centrifuges, all different things that are actually not allowed in the deal but the deal says, well, if one side is not living up to its uh, obligations at all, other sides can also reduce their obligations. So it's important to understand the U.S. violated the deal, left the deal. The Iranians are still in the deal. And what they're doing in terms of reducing their obligations, which are not good things, are nevertheless allowed by the deal because the deal had a mechanism to make sure that no side would be stuck in the deal having to implement it when the other parties to the deal are not implementing their obligations. But nevertheless, this means that the Iranian nuclear program has now in the last two years grown again. And the Iranians are at a breakout capability that is probably three to four months. And, and this is a technical term. It essentially means the amount of time it would take the Iranians from making a decision to build the material for a nuclear bomb to having that material for a nuclear bomb is now three to four months. As long as the deal was fully implemented and the US was part of the deal, that period would have been 12 months. And this was a critical uh, metric that the, Trump administra the Obama administration used. They wanted to make sure that as long as the deal was being implemented, the Iranians would always be a minimum of one year away from being able to have the material for a bomb. You take that measurement, combine it with all of the inspections that the Iranians had to accept, and you essentially make it impossible for the Iranians to build a nuclear bomb because the inspections and the verification, the transparency measures made sure that if the Iranians were to cheat, they would get caught within a week, if not sooner. So imagine this combination then. You have enough cameras and other uh, instruments in the nuclear deal that makes sure that if they cheat, they will be caught within a week. And if they cheat, they would need to be able to cheat for a full year and not get caught in order to be able to have a nuclear bomb. So the combination of them taking it a year, but then having so much inspections that make sure that they get caught within a week essentially made it impossible for them to be able to build a nuclear weapon. Now, the breakout capability is down to three to four months as a result of Trump walking out of the deal and everything that Trump said that he was going to be achieving, things have moved in the opposite direction. So if we take a look at why then Trump even made that decision, it's important to understand it because it's going to have an impact on how Biden makes his decisions and the options that he has. Trump had no clue or did not understand the nuclear negotiations or anything like that. And I don't even think that he would pretend that he did. He just wanted to get rid of this deal because it was Obama's legacy. 
The people who later on came in and advised him, however, understood that that was his desire, but they had their own objectives uh, in mind. So Bibi Netanyahu in Israel, the Saudis and others pushed this line with the Trump administration saying, the only mistake, the biggest mistake that Obama committed is that he ended up negotiating six months too early. If Obama had just let the sanctions on Iran stay for another six months, the Iranian economy would have been so crippled, the Iranians would have come begging for mercy, crawling to the negotiating table. So the argument to Trump then became, if you wanna get a better deal than Obama and be able to show that you are better than Obama, you need to reimpose all of those sanctions, impose additional sanctions, and just squeeze the crap out of the Iranians in order to make sure that they capitulate. You'll get a better deal, and then you can say that you were better than Obama. They knew, however, that that is not the way things will work. Because if the United States imposes sanctions on Iran, then the Iranians are likely going to restart their program, which means that they will get closer to a nuclear weapon, which then means that the risk of war increases and we will actually most likely end up in a war, which was more their objective than actually getting a different or a better deal. Trump didn't understand it. He went with their re recommendations and twice between 2018 and 2020, did the United States and Iran get so close to war. We're talking about literally minutes away from a full scale war between the United States and Iran. Uh, one of those times was when Trump had actually ordered attacks on Iran. Last minute, he changes his mind, orders the military back. And John Bolton, when he found out, he had gone home thinking that the war had started. He found out that Trump had reversed his decision. And in his book, he wrote that he was devastated to hear that Trump had reversed his decision and not started a war. Nevertheless, that maximum pressure strategy that Trump put together through the advice of the Israelis and the Saudis and others only made matters worse. It's why the Iranian breakout capability is now only three to four months, why tensions are high, why we almost got into war, and we are no better off for it in any way, shape, or form. Not a single one of the objectives of the Trump administration was achieved through that policy. Then comes President Biden. In the campaign, all of the Democratic presidential candidates vowed to go back into the JCPOA. It's actually part of the democratic platform that was voted on, that a return to the JCPOA is part of the Democratic Party's policy. The Biden administration made that clear during the campaign. This is what they're gonna do. They were extremely critical of Trump's um, policy of uh, uh, maximum pressure, deemed it to be a failure. But now when we have gotten into the Biden administration, a month has passed and nothing has yet happened. Let me first tell you what the plan at least originally was for the Biden administration. The Biden administration wanted to get back into the deal, but they also felt that now three to four years had been lost. And as a result, certain elements of the nuclear deal needed to be tightened, strengthened, and renegotiated. But in order to renegotiate these aspects, you need to be inside of the deal. The United States needed to rejoin the deal in order to renegotiate those elements. Otherwise, the Biden administration would end up doing exactly what the Trump administration did, which was be outside of the deal and then claim that you want to have a new negotiation. The difference between Biden and Trump would essentially be the name of the president. But other than that, the policy would be identical. Moreover, they then wanted to make sure that once they were back into the deal, they would renegotiate things such as the length of the restrictions, perhaps adding things on the missiles that the Iranians have, and start negotiations on regional issues, the regional dimensions that were um, not included in the JCPOA the first time around. These would be what would be called add-on agreements, meaning they're an agreement that is added onto an existing agreement. If you fail to reach an agreement on the add-ons, it does not jeopardize the existence of the current deal. And this is a very important distinction. It is not to say we have to get an agreement on missiles, otherwise the JCPA collapses. No, that would make the JCPOA hostage 
to negotiations over missiles, on the negotiations over Syria, negotiations over Yemen. The idea was to have an add-on agreement. The JCPOA is there, it's safe, but it would be very valuable to make sure that we get agreements on other aspects of uh, tensions between the United States and Iran. But in order to get there, you needed to move quickly to get back into the deal. And the reason why we needed to move quickly is not just because, you know, clearly signaling that a new policy is coming into place, but because the Iranians are having their elections, their presidential elections in June of this year, which means that by roughly mid-March, the Iranians will be entering their political season. Once they're in their political season, they will most likely not be capable of negotiating Moreover, it's not necessarily wise for the United States to negotiate with them while they're in their political season. And it is quite likely that the next president of Iran will be a conservative. It is quite likely that the next president of Iran, much like the Republicans in 2016, will run on a platform opposing the JCPOA, critical of these negotiations, because the Iranian perception is that they got completely screwed by the JCPOA. All of the mechanisms that had been put into the deal, into the negotiations, were aimed at making sure that Iran could not cheat. I talked about the breakout capability and the combination of verification and, and restrictions. There were no mechanisms that were put in place to make sure that the United States would not be able to cheat or breach the deal. But that is what happened. Iran is currently still under Biden, under the bizarre situation in which it is under more sanctions now when it's actually inside the JCPOA, part of that agreement, than it was before it even signed the agreement. So if the deal was aimed at lifting sanctions, the Iranians are in a worse situation now than before they even signed the agreement. The United States is still now under Biden in the bizarre and unique position in which the United States is actually punishing countries for abiding by a UN Security Council resolution rather than violating it. The Iran nuclear deal is embodied in a UN Security Council resolution and the Trump administration as part of their um, maximum pressure strategy actually sanctioned countries if they abided by the JCPOA. That has never happened before. If we sanctioned the country, it was because they were violating a, a new UN Security Council resolution. Now we have been sanctioning countries, punishing them for actually abiding by an agreement. That has still not changed. So the question then is, if the Biden administration doesn't move fast, really fast, roughly a month's time, there's a significant likelihood that the JCPOA will be lost altogether because the next Iranian president is likely going to run against it. Uh, and then we may have a situation in which it's not just the United States that is outside of the deal, the Iranians are outside of the deal as well. If the US and Iran are outside of the deal, then there is no deal. There's nothing there for the Europeans or the Chinese and others to be in if the main principles of this agreement, the United States and Iran are not inside of it. And clock is running out right now on this issue. Um, the concerns that the Biden administration has is probably plentiful. It's not necessarily the details of the deal, I suspect. I think it is the whole variety of issues that the Biden administration is forced to deal with. This is not an administration that comes into office and has a 100-day honeymoon in which they can take their jolly time to find who is going to head what department, etc. cetera. Um, on the contrary, because of what has happened in the last four years, they need to move really quickly and they need to deal with a pandemic. They need to deal with potential great co power competition with the Chinese, climate change, all of these different crises in an extremely, extremely divided America that we have seen no signs yet of any reconciliation being on the horizon. All of those different things the Biden administration has to deal with. And that may be the best explanation as to why they haven't moved fast enough. But at the same time, it should not be forgotten they have moved fast on issues that don't have deadlines. I personally am delighted to see that the Biden administration chose to quickly put an end to U.S. support for the Saudi-led war in Yemen by ending arms sales, at least so far on offensive uh, operations, hopefully will be complete.
that is great. But there was no deadline that forced them to move so quickly on that issue. There is a natural deadline when it comes to the JCPO, and it's not just the elections. Next uh, week on February 23rd, the Iranian parliament has passed a law that says that if the Iran Americans are not back in the deal or starting to lift sanctions, the Iranians will further reduce their obligations. And this time it would be to give res uh, restrict the ability of IEA inspectors to inspect the nuclear program. That would be a very problematic move, not an irreversible move, but it would further um, poison the atmosphere and make it more difficult for the Biden administration to move in the right direction. So on an issue that actually has deadlines that are coming up, some artificial, some completely natural, it would have been nice to see much faster action on this, not just because of the promises that Biden made, but because he will be the one that will be responsible for dealing with a far deeper crisis if he takes too long time to deal with it right now. I'll stop there and take your questions. Thank you You're so welcome. much for, for starting this important conversation, urgent conversation, in fact. Um, and we're looking forward to your questions and comments, which you can send to the chat. Uh, Joanna will help me monitor your questions. So uh, you can either raise your hand or send the questions directly to your chat. One thing that came up as I was listening to you, Dr. Parsi, and thank you so much for that analysis. How aware are the relevant policymakers in the State Department and in other aspects, uh, other policy uh, responsibles in the Biden administration of this urgency, of this timeline, of the fact that there is this one month to try to um, to try to solidify things? Are you confident uh, so, about so, so, those who are in, who are dealing with this? Yeah. Yeah, I would actually say, you know, uh, Tony Blinken was the Secretary of State. He was part of the negotiations or he was part of the team. Um, Jake Sullivan was actually one of the early people who led the secret negotiations in the country of Oman. Um, Rob Malley, who's been the Iran envoy, was a critical person and extremely competent and, and creative negotiator uh, who's deeply committed to the JCPA. Biden himself senses a strong sense of ownership for the deal. So, this is actually part of the reason why this is perplexing. I don't think anyone can really legitimately, based on the information we have so far, make the case that this team is not committed on returning to the JCPA, that they're not uh, dedicated and, and that their intention is different. But it's precisely because their intention is to stay within the deal or go back into the deal that it's a little bit perplexing to see that there's not faster movement on this front. What they have spent the time doing so far is to do consultations with the Europeans, with the Chinese Russians, but primarily with the Israelis and the Saudis. I do not believe many of them at all have or should have um, confidence that they can convince the Saudis and the Israelis to stop and the UAE to stop their opposition to this uh, agreement. Um, I think that's a completely um, um, uh, dead race. It's not going to work. Now, they may be feeling the need to do so to show goodwill and to at least show that they're willing to listen. Um, and that's perfectly fine. I think that's good diplomacy. The only thing is that should not come at the expense of this deadline. Uh, because again, I think it's one thing to disregard the Majlis deadline. It's arguably an artificial deadline. The elections are, is a natural deadline. It's, it, it was not put in there <laughs> to put pressure on the US to get back into the deal. That was that you know, they have their political cycles and this uh, date for this election has been set a long time ago. To ignore that and then potentially having to deal with a hostile Iranian government afterwards is just would make this crisis a hundred times worse. Right now, for the next five, six weeks, we have an opportunity to make sure that the very same people on the American side can negotiate with the very same people on the Iranian side that negotiated this deal five years ago. So why not take advantage of that right away? Absolutely. Um, questions, comments? Um, uh, first for students, but if not, I see uh, Murray Shapiro, but let's first encourage students. First of all, you know how to use the chat room much more easily, but more importantly, uh, I'm sure you have questions about this very complicated situation and we'd be delighted to entertain your questions. Initially, 
but if not, we will go to Murray. Um, holding up your hand, make sure you turn off your turn on your mic, Murray. I, I did. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Uh, the most serious concern about the original uh, Iran deal was the um, sunset clauses in which when the terms of the deal were over, Iran would have an opportunity legally to pursue the development of a nuclear weapon. Could you comment on that and whether that's an issue that continues to be an obstacle to renegotiating the terms of a new deal? Thank you, Murray. Um, I'm afraid that is actually entirely incorrect. There are sunset clauses, or, or it's not sunset clauses, there are restrictions on the deal that expire. That is the case on all arms deals. In fact, most arms deals are only for five years and they need to be actively renewed by both sides. There's absolutely nothing that expires, nothing that gives the Iranians a legal pathway to a nuclear weapon. There is no such thing that exists. Iran is, is still a member of the NPT, and the most important element of the deal that prevents the Iranians from being able to build a nuclear weapon is the transparency measures, and those transparency measures are permanent. They do not expire. They're part of the additional protocol to the NPT agreement, and the additional protocol in year 2023, the Iranians are supposed to ratify in their parliament so it becomes part of their law but they will only do so because that's supposed to happen at the same time that the US through congressional actions permanently lift sanctions. That requires the US to be in the deal. So if one is worried that there's gonna be restrictions that will be lifted in 2030, those restrictions will be lifted tomorrow if the United States does not go back into the deal. So there, there's, a, there's a problem with that argument that people have been complaining there are certain things that get re restrictions that get lifted. So let's not have a deal at all and make sure that those restrictions get lifted right away. It doesn't make any sense. Now, if the argument is, which the Israelis put forward, that these restrictions, so for instance, how many kilos of low and rich uranium can the Iranians have on their own soil? Um, that those should be permanent. They should never, ever, ever, ever be lifted. Here's why that is simply impossible. You have Whoa. in the country, in the world right now, three categories of countries. Category one is where the US is. A country that is a member of the NPT, but has nuclear weapons. The United States, Russia, China, France, UK. Then you have countries that are part of the NPT, but don't have nuclear weapons. And that's the vast majority of countries, Sweden, Japan, Germany, uh, yeah, Germany, Belgium. And then you have a third category, which is countries that are not part of the NPT, but have nuclear weapons. India, Israel, North Korea, they used to be part of the NPT and they walked out of it, Pakistan. If we had permanent restrictions, meaning that the Iranians would never be able to have more than 400 kilos of LU, for instance, then we would have created a fourth category. Meaning, here's a country that is part of the NPT, doesn't have nuclear weapons, but also doesn't have the same rights as other NPT members, even though it is in good standing with the NPT. Because the Iranians would not be able to do what the Swedes are doing or what the Belgians are doing after 2030. There is no way ever the United States would be able to get that unless the United States invaded Iran and occupied the country with ground troops. It's only under those circumstances you can impose that type of restriction on the country. And the framework for this negotiation was the NPT, meaning that we would find a way to make sure that the Iranians don't get a weapon, that the Iranians would be in, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, essentially in the doghouse, uh, for 10, 15 years in which they had to prove that their intention is not to build weapons in which they would have to regain the confidence of the international community by living up to these standards. And then the restrictions would be lifted, meaning that Iran would be able to be a country that is part of the NPT, but doesn't build a nuclear weapon and can't build a nuclear weapon, but it has all of the other rights that the NPT members have. That was the entire plan. If 
we tried to go outside of the NPT, which is what we did during the Bush years, in which we said, we're only going to negotiate in order to make sure that the Iranians don't have any nuclear enrichment at all. Then we saw that there were no negotiations taking place at all. And during that period, the Iranians dramatically expanded their nuclear program because we were making a demand that had no legal basis. We were saying to a country that's part of a, that is part of a treaty that you can be part of the treaty, but you will not have any of the rights of the countries that are part of the treaty. And the, the, the push for making that demand were coming from countries that were not part of the treaty in the first place. It's simply an imp impossibility. And it's a danger in which some countries and some voices have been asking for such demands precisely because they knew it can never be achieved, the negotiations would fail, and the United States would be gravitating towards war with Iran. Great, we've got some wonderful questions. Um, one from um, Rosemary uh, Pace or Pache. Is there a possibility that the delay on the part of the Biden administration is intentional? They miss the deadline to act and can say that it was Iran's fault or simply hide behind the missed deadline to do nothing. And also what about the entry into force of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons? Shouldn't that have an effect on the Iran deal? Let me take the first question. Um, if that is the intent, I don't believe that is the intent of the Biden administration, but if that were to be the intent of the Biden administration, it would be a major break uh, of a promise they made during the campaign, a break of what the platform of the Democrats are saying. I'm not saying that's an impossibility or it has never happened that a politician has made a promise and then broke it, obviously. But I don't think that the very same people that spent such a tremendous amount of time working so hard to get this deal would now go back in with a plan of undoing it this way. It doesn't, so for instance, um, Rob Malley was the head of the ICG. It's a pretty good job. Why would he take uh, a job to go into the administration for the deceptive purpose of pretending that they wanna restart the nuclear program or re-enter the nuclear program only, but in reality to pursue a strategy aimed at uh, destroying it and shifting the blame onto the Iranians. It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Moreover, if even that was the intent, this is not a particularly clever way of doing it because it's not shifting the blame onto the Iranians. It's making the Biden administration look terribly uh, undifferent from the Trump administration. It would actually be smarter if you really was, if that was the intent to go back into the deal um, and then uh, let the next Iranian president, the conservative most likely, uh, if they want to walk out of the deal, well, then they walk out of the deal and then the fault is theirs. Uh, so if that is the intent, it actually still would make more sense for the U.S. to quickly go back into the deal. But I think it's fascinating that that question is asked. I'm hearing it being asked elsewhere as well, precisely because everyone is scratching their heads and trying to figure out what's taking so long. Why isn't something more happening? Great, great, great. Um, a question from David DeBeer, uh, what do you see as Iran's motive for developing nuclear weapons? Do they differ from the motives of the existing nuclear powers? So uh, important to keep in mind, the Iranians have never actually had a really full scale nuclear weapons program. There were some experimentation with technology that could be used for a nuclear weapon. There's some things that suggest that the Iranians clearly violated the NPT before 2003, but an actual nuclear weapons program is not something that they've obsessed. They've never said that they wanted it either. And the US, the Israeli, the European intelligence, remember the, the uh, intelligence estimate that came out in 2007 that actually made clear they had not been doing anything of that kind since 2003. What I think the Iranian plan was and it was the same plan during the time of the Shah, was to simply do what is legally permissible, which is build a nuclear program, a civilian program. Through that, gain knowledge of the fuel cycle and all the technology, and then be in a position legally in which if you make a decision to build a bomb, you have enough material, you have enough know-how, so you can shift over to a nuclear weapons program within six months. 
Some people argue that today, Japan is essentially half a screw turn away from being able to have a nuclear weapon because their nuclear program, their civilian program is so advanced. So if they wanted to, it would be an easy shift. The JCPO actually prevented that from happening. It's no, so it's reduced even what they were legally permitted to be because of the inspections regime that is so intrusive and permanent that it simply would not allow them to be able to or enable them to do it without getting caught right away. Now, why did the Iranians actually, did the better question I would say, why did the Iranians not have a nuclear weapon? I mean, you're in the Middle East. We always hear that the motivation for the Israelis to have a nuclear weapon is because they live in a tough neighborhood. Well, everyone who lives in that neighborhood can say they live in a tough neighborhood and the Iranians also live in that neighborhood. Uh, the reason why the Iranian, and, and also remember this, the Iranian nuclear program started in the late 1960s with the encouragement, active encouragement of the United States. It was actually part of the Adams for Peace program that the US uh, was pursuing at the time. And the US actually was pushing the Iranians to do much, much more and to use American uh, Westinghouse and other American companies to do it. Uh, so it was seen as a commercial um, interest from the US side. Um, so they've had that program for more than 50, 60 years. If they were so adamant about nuclear weapons, we have to ask ourselves, what's taken them so long, mindful of the fact that the Pakistanis went from zero to a nuclear weapon in, a ni in nine and a half years? Are the Iranians not as capable as the Pakistanis? What's the thing that actually explains that the Pakistanis could do this in nine years and the Iranians after 50 years still don't have it? Well, part of the reason is it actually doesn't make geostrategic sense for the Iranians to have nuclear weapons. If the Iranians, mindful of their conventional military position in the region, they're one of the most populous countries in the region, one of the largest countries in the region, one of the best strategically located countries in the region with the Persian Gulf, uh, control of the Hormuz Straits, if they were, so, and that is part of the reason why historically Iran has been a superpower in that region more often than not. If the Iranians were to build a nuclear weapon and contribute to a nuclear arm race in the region, what would happen? Well, then small countries, let's say Bahrain, that doesn't even have a 50th of Iran's population, doesn't even have a 50th of Iran's land mass, could also build a nuclear weapon. And suddenly, mighty Iran is on strategic parity with tiny Bahrain. And Iran would have completely lost its conventional superiority and advantage in the region. There's a reason why the two most populous countries in the Middle East, Iran and Egypt, were the ones who drove the initiative in 1973 for a Middle East a nuclear free zone in the Middle East. A w uh, MD, uh, free zone in the Middle East. They're the countries that would lose the most if the region was nuclearized. A much smaller country like Israel with no strategic depth has a completely different calculation, completely different strategic calculation as to whether there is utility in building nuclear weapons or not. So there's a natural reason why the Iranians wouldn't go in that direction. That natural reason, of course, can dramatically change. And the biggest thing that could change it is if a major power from outside of the region was so threatening to Iran that the Iranians would feel that the only way they actually could deter that threat is by building a nuclear weapon. I don't know, say the United States or the Soviet Union or Russia. That could change that calculation. And that's part of the reason I think we have to be very careful that in our own approach, however justified our concerns are with Iran, we should not behave in such a way that we actually help them develop incentives to go nuclear. And let me give you an example as to why that actually is a very real risk today. How did the Trump administration treat Iran who did not have a nuclear weapon and that had signed an agreement that would made it impossible for them to build a nuclear weapon? And how did Trump treat North Korea who had nuclear weapons, had delivery systems that could reach the West Coast of the United States? Well, he rushed to ne negotiate with them, and which I think is actually fine. I'm happy that there were negotiations. And embraced Kim Jong-un, had lovely letters to each other. If you're sitting in Tehran and you're seeing that, the conclusion you draw is, you know what? 
if there should have been negotiations with the United States, it should have taken place once the Iranians at least had a little bit more of a nuclear program, perhaps even a nuclear weapon, rather than going and negotiating with the United States at a time when all the Iranians had was nuclear enrichment. That is not an incentive structure that we should be creating for countries. Great. We have a great question from one of our students in our peace studies class known as Moose. Uh, he says, how much does history between Iran and the US play into the negotiations of today? Iran and most of the Middle East has developed a distrust over the decades in part because of American interference in their politics. And I just wonder if there's a negative impression of America among the general public of Iran. It's a great question and it's absolutely true. Um, history is the context in which all of this is happening. History is the, what forms the individuals within these negotiations, their own perceptions and whether it's trust, mistrust, um, all of those things, in the case of the US and Iran, it's mostly mistrust. Um, both sides have committed a tremendous amount of, um, uh, inflicted a lot of pain on each other. Um, uh, both sides can come up with long lists of errors that the other side have committed. Um, and that is part of the reason why getting to the negotiating table in and of itself is such a difficult thing to do in a case when the mistrust is as deep as it was between the United States and Iran. Yeah. Which is also why it is so dangerous that if you actually manage to get a deal, if you violate it, the amount of mistrust that will be created will be beyond what existed before the agreement was signed. Because now you actually have an empirical case. Before you were mistrustful, because you thought the other side might do X, Y, and Z. Now you can point to a specific case. We trusted them and look what happened. We paid a heavy price. That's part of the reason why from the US side, it was so important to make sure that we had all kinds of mechanisms to make sure that Iran couldn't cheat. It's not just because if they cheated, they could build, potentially build a nuclear weapon or have a pathway to it and that would be problematic. It would also be if they cheated, how could we ever make sure that we actually had an agreement again that could work, that we could be confident about? It lied in our interest to make sure that they even didn't try to cheat because it so damaged the situation. Now it has, so happens is that we cheated and now they're, and not just them. What happened with the United States cheating on that agreement, walking out of Paris and a whole set of other things is that every other country, not just enemies or challengers of the United States, but friends of the United States, cannot any longer make that um, bet on being able to trust the United States. And it's not a mistrust of Biden. It's not even a mistrust of whoever comes after Biden. It's just that realistic perspective, look at the United States, seeing what a divided country we are and knowing that whatever this administration chooses, the next administration may all, almost be politically forced to undo everything because our country is so divided. You cannot put trust in a country like that. We need to fix our internal situation first in order to be able to convincingly signal other countries that whatever political storms we have internally, it's not gonna affect our foreign policy. I'm also glad that, uh, that he was, I think, referring to the, a history that Americans don't know much about, you know, the role of the CIA in overthrowing Mossadegh and in establishing the Shah. And, you know, I think again, too often Americans come in in the middle of the movie and we tend not to know about the history and the conditions that may have been key in constructing that mistrust. So I'm glad, I'm glad. That I, I think you're absolutely right. So it, it is a great question. And using your metaphor, um, the movie started in 1979 for Americans. That's when the hostage crisis happened. And that's when most people in the United States even gain consciousness of the existence of Iran. For the Iranians, it started in 1953 because of the CIA coup. Yeah. Um, and it does color a lot of things. I do want to say one thing though, for the generation of Iranians there today, it's not that they've forgotten about 53. It's not as if it's not living memory. They know about it, everyone does. But I do think the US's support for Saddam Hussein 
in the Iraq-Iran war, particularly when it came to the use of chemical weapons, is probably the memory that is much fresher. Um, and just to give you an example, prior to this team on the Iranian side negotiating, uh, meaning the Rouhani team, the Ahmadinejad team, their lead negotiator was someone called Saeed Jalili, who fought in the Iraq-Iran war and is a victim of chemical weapons um, and still has those scars to show for it. And he liked to waste time in the negotiations uh, for hours by just giving lectures about um, uh, the use of chemical weapons by Saddam with the blessing, um, active and implicit at times, by the United States and other Western powers. Great. We have a, a next question um, from Harry Pollack, who asks, should any arrangement that gives Iran relief from sanctions and a great deal of funds also demand they stop supporting terrorist groups and destabilizing the Middle East? Thank you. Um, it's a great question. and. It, what it points to is that the nuclear issue clearly is not the only concern that the United States had with Iran. There's concern about Iran's activities in Yemen, in, in Syria, and elsewhere, and, and support for a variety of uh, different groups that are uh, highly problematic uh, from a, an American perspective. The issue, first, that we need to recognize, you know, it wasn't as if the negotiations on the nuclear issue were exclusively on the nuclear issue because people just like to deal with the nuclear issue more or that it was haphazardly decided in such a way. That's not the case. The, the country that most aggressively pushed the United States to focus on the nuclear issue was the Israelis. They had been making the case since 1995, 96, that the Iranian nuclear program constituted an existential threat to Israel. That has been part of the government line, but there's been numerous government officials in Israel that actually question that publicly. Three members, uh, three heads of the Mossad in a row did not buy into the idea that Iran is an existential threat. Iran is a major challenge, but they didn't want to use the word existential. Uh, Ehud Barak, since 1992, has been on record and you know rejecting it because he thinks that that type of a language diminishes Israel's own significant capabilities, and he didn't want to use language that did so. But the overall message from the Israelis have been that this is an existential threat. What does that mean? It means that it's the priority. It means that that's the issue you have to deal with first. And you cannot put support for terrorism or you know, involvement in Yemen at the same level as an existential threat because Iran's involvement in Syria is not an existential threat to the Israelis according to the Israelis. Iran's involvement in Yemen is not an existential threat according to themselves. So, because of the pressure from some of these countries, that's what was decided. That is part of the reason, it's not the entire reason. The other reason is in order to ensure that you have a successful negotiation, there was a need for all of the P5 plus one to be in agreement on what they're negotiating with so in order for them to have a united front vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Otherwise the Iranians would use, you know, would use the, those differences and they would play the Russians against the Americans and the Chinese against the French, et cetera. So you needed to have a united front, which meant you needed to make sure that you focused on the issue when all of the P5 plus one were in agreement, which was on the nuclear issue. When it comes to terrorism, there's absolutely no such agreement because groups that the United States deems to be terrorists or the Israelis or the Saudis is not deemed to be terrorists by many of the others in the P5 plus one. If it comes to Syria, the Russians and the Chinese are much closer to Iran on the Syrian issue than they are to the US, much closer, or in Yemen. So then you would have a completely split P5 plus one and you could not have any effective negotiations. And you know it's fascinating that the Saudis and Israelis and others have now come out and claimed that one of the main weaknesses of the agreement was that the, new, the, the regional issues were not addressed. Um, because when the negotiations took place, it was actually the Israelis and the Saudis that were the most aggressive in pushing to make sure that the agenda was not expanded beyond the nuclear issue. The Israelis were fearful that if regional issues, terrorism, whatever you wanna call it was included, the Iranians could give concessions in Syria in order to get in a concession on the nuclear issue from the American side. 
And precisely because it was the nuclear issue that was deemed an existential issue, they didn't want to see any such trading between these issues. So they pushed very aggressively to make sure that the deal only would deal with the nuclear issue. The Saudis did not want to see the United States talk to the Iranians about regional issues at all if the Saudis were not at the table. But as soon as the deal was struck, then they came with the argument that this is one of their weaknesses. And if you don't take my word for it, I encourage you to go and search for the panel discussion that took place in October, I think, 2015, where at the, what is it called? Uh, the 96th Street Synagogue or something like that up in New York. Uh, they had a great panel discussion. It was with uh, Efraim Halevi, who was the former head of the Mossad. It was with Prince Turkey, who was the former head of the Saudi intelligence. And the question was asked, why weren't these other issues addressed in the JCPOA? And if I'm Alevi's answer was because we asked the Americans not to address them. Simple as that. Now, does that mean they shouldn't be addressed? No, of course they should be addressed. But that's what the entire add-on agreement is there for, as I mentioned earlier on in the presentation. We go back into the deal. We're actually living up to our obligations. And then we start new negotiation on a whole set of different issues whether it is terrorism, whether it is Yemen, whatever it is. And the Iranians, incidentally, are going to come with demands. They're particularly going to come with a demand, which is how can we get the United States to stop destabilizing the Middle East, mindful of the fact that it was the United States that invaded Iraq. It wasn't the Iranians. And it's been the most destabilizing event of the Middle East for the last 40 years. So there's, you know, there's going to be a lot of different opinions, but we should absolutely get to that point. But we get to that point by joining, rejoining the JCPA, not by doing the strategy that Trump pursued. Okay, we've got a question from um, Arnold Levine who says, didn't Iran violate the inspections by not allowing them at military facilities? No, if that had been the case, you would have heard a tremendous amount about it. Uh, the IAEA has been quite clear that when it comes to uh, access to various uh, uh, places in Iran, they have been getting that access. That access, incidentally, unfortunately, may be restricted next week because of this law in the Majlis. But up until this point, that has not been the case. Um, in fact, one of the places that IA asked to um, uh, inspect had already been inspected several times. It had been an agreement between the IEA and the Iranians that that case was now closed. The IEA came back and asked for inspecting again and the Iranians actually gave them access one more time. Now, the word is used, in, and I see uh, Arnold's message in the chat, is military facilities. The IEA and the nuclear deal did not give the, uh, them the right to inspect any military facility as they wanted. Uh, the US doesn't give any access whatsoever to the IEA or any other state. Uh, but when it came to facilities that there was convincing plausible intelligence that something nuclear and fishy had taken place, the Iranians would essentially be forced to give access. But it lies in the interest of the IEA to not go on a fishing expedition. Because if the IEA just goes around the country and looks for things without any evidence, eventually the deal would break down and the entire inspections regimes, the credibility of it would fall apart. So the IEA rightfully sets a high bar. They're not just gonna go ask for access if there isn't evidence that they think is sufficiently strong to justify that request. And that is what they've done. And when they have done it, the Iranians have accepted. However, I wanna emphasize, this may not be the case if we don't go back into the JCPOA. If we leave, all of these different things likely will be lost. And then will we complain about the fact that we don't have them anymore? Great. I've got a question from my colleague, uh, Mike Dinocenzo, if I can um, manage to decipher. It's a bit haiku, Mike, but uh, it, I think it says, are there some back channels in terms of the negotiations going on? And is that, you know, uh, even in thinking back to the other, other deals, other arrangements, other treaties, you know, so often that is the case that there are, it, and there's so, that's why it's so important to have these connections and have a kind of diplomatic literacy is to be able to utilize back channels. Is that the case? There are, there are countries that have been um, 
as of late helped um, deliver messages back and forth. There are other type of mechanisms. Those are extremely valuable, extremely helpful. They are, however, not an alternative to direct negotiations. They will not be able to resolve the issue. Um, so as, as valuable as it is that those exist, and there were a moment in time when not even that existed. So when it came to existence, it was a huge positive. We're now in a situation in which that is simply insufficient, where it's very valuable that it's there, it's gonna be helpful towards getting to a solution. But the real solution has to be that the two sides need to talk to each other directly. Otherwise, this is not gonna get resolved. Um, and and you know, there can be facilitators. I mean, the Europeans can definitely play that role. They've played it in the past. Um, Oman has played it in the past. The Qatari government right now seeks to see if it can be helpful. That's all great, welcome useful, needed, ultimately insufficient. Great. Um, Marty has a question. Marty, unmute your mic first. <laughs> it's so, yes. Great. I was wondering, Krita, if you might elaborate about the domestic forces that are against us going back into the treaty. So, sorry, could you, could you repeat? Yeah. I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit about the domestic forces in the United States that are against us going back into the treaty. Yeah, so um, this was always uh, a split in the United States. And we saw that in 2015, the fight in Congress was in some ways um, even bloodier than the actual negotiations themselves uh, in, in some ways. Um, Today, the situation is different. There's definitely a split. There's definitely very powerful forces internally in favor and against the deal. But the constellation has changed somewhat, some way, somewhat. And that is that um, the support within the Democratic Party amongst members of Congress on the Democratic side, as well as amongst um, the grassroots on the Democratic side, I would say is quite a bit stronger today than it was in 2015. In 2015, this was a bet. A lot of members of Congress were a little bit hesitant. They were worried as to whether the Iranians would cheat or not, whether it would work or not, but they gave their support, but they had their reservations. And you could see that in their statements. You know, very few just wrote a, um, um, a press release with one paragraph saying, I endorse it. A lot of them came with a whole set of different caveats. This is what I'm worried about, et cetera. But nevertheless, uh, by and large, most of them supported it. Today, we have several years of experience that A, shows the deal worked. The Iranians lived up to the agreement. They did not cheat on the agreement. And B, we know what the alternative is. The alternative is what Trump pursued and it was disastrous and got us very close to war and it will get us close to war if we go down that path again. That has actually made the, the choice and the decision much, much easier than it was before. Things that were unclear were theoretical, that were essentially a bet, have now become empirical experience. And as a result, uh, you have a much easier time to see members of Congress on the Democratic side strongly support the deal uh, without all of these other caveats that they did have before, because now they actually seen the value of it. Uh, on the Republican side, a, a, a different development has occurred. Um, I would say the vast majority of Republicans, frankly, did not uh, oppose the deal because of any particular details, whether it was that the restrictions were too few or too short, because you know they all came out against it without having read the agreement. And it was very clear, they did not even bother reading the agreement. They were just opposed to the idea because this was Obama's initiative, because it was a democratic initiative and this was a partisan issue for them. Trump came in and turned it beyond being a partisan issue, turned it into a Trump issue. Even the members on the Republican side that saw the tremendous dangers of what Trump were doing, like much else that happened after at least a year into his presidency, they did not have the guts to come out and criticize the president. That would be 
asking for trouble in their next primary if they did. With Trump gone now, although we haven't quite seen exactly where the party lands, it's going to be quite interesting to see if there's going to be shifters within the Republican side as well. Is it the partisanship that takes over? Uh, will there be lingering loyalty towards Trump? Or will there be other factors that causes them to stick with their old decision or perhaps change them? When it comes to interest groups that have been pushing against this, this is primarily something that is pushed for by groups that are very, who have very strong uh, sympathies or tend to see the region and the US's role in a very similar way to uh, the right wing in Israel with the Netanyahu government. Uh, but it is not, you know, the vast majority of uh, the Jewish American population, for instance, supported the JCPOA. In fact, a higher proportion of Jewish Americans supported the nuclear deal than the average American population did. Uh, and you had major Jewish American organizations such as J Street that played an absolute pivotal role in 2015 and continue to play that role today in terms of drumming up support for the deal in Congress. So it's, it's um, it, and incidentally, it was also very interesting that there were quite a few Israeli officials and generals that were lobbying in favor of the deal in 2015 at the same time as the Israeli embassy and the Israeli government officially lobbied very aggressively against it. There were Israeli generals on Capitol Hill touring office to office lobbying for the agreement. Um, so today I would say that frankly, the support is stronger than it was before, but the dedication of those who are opposed to it is frankly impressive uh, and has not necessarily fizzled out in any way, shape or form. But I don't think that political concern, domestic political concern is or should be at the top of Biden's calculations right now. He just won an election. I hope he's not thinking about midterms already now. That would really just turn our political system to a series of elections and no actual governing at all. Great. We've got another uh, good question from one of our students in our uh, peace studies class. Uh, Nathaniel, he says, if local regional powers cannot fully agree on the deal, then what is the validity of a worldwide arbitration? I know that this is the UN's purpose, but it supersedes the wishes of sovereign nations with shared borders now that Iraq is a de facto um, permissible to all regional entities. He goes on to say, I'm not saying I'm against the deal and the UN, but wouldn't it heighten the Sunni plus Israel via Shia divide if Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Israel are upset? Thank you. Um, several, great question, several aspects to it. Um, the nuclear deal is a global issue. It is not just a regional issue. In fact, um, global powers have been working on it and been more concerned about it than many of the regional issues. So including them in the uh, nuclear issue negotiation was never an option and I don't think is an option today. The student is absolutely correct, however, I would say when it comes to the regional issues. If we get back into the deal and if we then get to regional negotiations, let's say on Yemen, for instance, or on Persian Gulf security, those would be completely meaningless if the Saudis and the Emiratis are not included and everyone else uh, on the Arabian Peninsula. That would simply not work. And I don't, I don't think even the United States would be pursuing that. It makes no sense whatsoever. So when it comes to those issues, it's absolutely essential that those countries are included. But to include them now in the nuclear issue, there's no appetite for it for a very simple reason. The Saudis, the Emiratis, the Israelis have made it very clear that they're not interested in getting a deal. They've been interested in making sure that there is no deal. Um, in the case of the Saudis, for instance, I quoted in my last book, uh, Colin Cal, who's now Deputy Defense Secretary, who was working for Biden at the time, told me the Saudis never came to us and said, you know, make sure that there's less centrifuge or make sure that these restrictions are stricter. Though they didn't have any concerns about the specifics of the deal. Their concern was, how can you make a deal with that country? Their concern was that there was a deal, that there would be a deal at all. I would say that the Israeli concern is actually very similar. 
even though the Israelis definitely have nuclear knowledge because they have their own nuclear weapons, et cetera, and actually came in with specific requests, but the entire concept of a breakout capability is an Israeli concept that the US adopted. Um, but there is something that binds these three countries together. And it's frankly not Iran. Iran is there. It is important. But there's something else going on that has made that coalition that we've now seen. If the United States strikes a deal, doesn't matter what the details of the deal is with the Iranians, what will happen? Well, the nuclear issue will more or less go away. The United States and Iran will slowly but surely start getting more normal in their relations. And it would, as a result, reduce the tensions between the US and Iran, which would have a very, very profound geostrategic impact on the region as a whole. Without that tension with Iran, the United States would slowly but surely be able to extract its military from the Middle East, reduce its military footprint in the Persian Gulf and beyond, which is what almost now three presidents in a row have said that they want to do, and shift their focus elsewhere and you know, as the, the atmosphere in Washington right now is, it would be to do so in order to shift their focus towards China, which many in Washington rightly or wrongly view as uh, the big uh, geopolitical challenge of this century. If that were to happen, what would that do to the balance of power in the region? Well, if the US is no longer there with its 58,000 troops currently, the balance in the region would shift away from Saudi Arabia and the UAE and from Israel. And it would essentially shift uh, in the direction of the Iranians because the balance we have right now is an artificial one. It's there because of an extra regional power. The United States has put its most powerful military in the region. The Israelis will be fine because Israel is a very powerful country with a very, very sophisticated industrial and scientific base and its own military that it can be self-sustainable. And they've done that deliberately because of their own historical experience. But if you're sitting in Saudi Arabia and the UAE, you got to be pretty worried because the balance of power you're enjoying right now, the maneuverability you're enjoying right now, you could never enjoy on the basis of your own power. You can only do so because the United States has decided to give you a security umbrella and to contain economically, politically, your main regional rival, which is Iran at least from the Saudi perspective. So there's no variation of this deal that would get the Saudis and the UAE to think it's a good deal. This is not in their interest. And as a result, I don't see why they would be included uh, in the nuclear deal, because this has been recognized that this is not what they're trying, they're not trying to help. But once we get to the regional negotiations, then absolutely they need to be included because they have a direct stake in it. And at that point, they will probably also have incentives to make sure that some sort of an arrangement is reached. Great, so, um, well, this will be our last question because uh, Dr. Farsi has to, to leave in five minutes. So, and delightedly, it's again from Moose who has actually looked at your first book uh, and says in that book, you argue that the complications between Iran and Israel is not a battle of differing ideologies, but rather a battle of strategies. Could you possibly elaborate on that statement? And do you think that there are other conflicts between nations that get represent, misrepresented in this way? Thank you so much, Moose. I, I appreciate that question. Uh, yes, you're right. What I write in that book is that the root of the conflict between Iran and Israel is not an ideological one. The Israelis and the Iranians have actually had good relations back in the 50s and 60s, 70s, even under the Khomeini government in the 80s, the Israelis and the Iranians continued to collaborate because they had common geopolitical uh, imperatives, despite the fact that at the time the Iranians had a very anti-Israeli ideology and they continued to do. Um, but then in the 1990s, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Iraq was defeated by, by the United States, the very same geopolitical factors that pushed Iran and Israel closer together evaporated and they started seeing each other as geopolitical rivals. And we see the, the root of the real tense uh, enmity between them being what happened in the 1990s rather than the 1980s. If ideology was the driving force of this, we would have expected a very bad relationship between them in the 80s and then a warm up 
in the 1990s when Iran's ideological zeal actually cooled quite significantly. Instead, we see the opposite. They were collaborating in the 80s. The Israelis were the main lobbyists for the Iranians back then. They were the ones who were telling Washington, talk to Iran, sell arms to Iran, and don't pay attention to Iranian rhetoric and threats of annihilation, et cetera. And then um, back in, in the 1990s, when actually the Iranians cooled the rhetoric, we would have seen something else. But on the contrary, that's when the real tensity came. So it, it's an argument to, um, to essentially say that this actually is a good thing, because at the end of the day, ideological battles uh, only have winners and losers, and they end up in a clash. Uh, there's no such thing as a draw. But in geopolitical competition, there are numerous solutions and numerous ways that you actually can prevent a direct confrontation. And, and a confrontation between Iran and Israel is absolutely, uh, stopping it is absolutely achievable. When it comes to the question of other countries whose competition actually is more geostrategic but presented as ideological, if I could give other examples, I cannot on the top of my mind, I'm sure there are other cases. The reason I focused on Iran and Israel was because it was so blatant. You have in Israel, a state that is based on an ideology, Zionism. In Iran, in the 1979 revolution, you got a, a regime that was completely based on ideology. Uh, so it would make it a very interesting test case to see with such strong ideological impetus on both sides, did that nevertheless end up becoming the driving force of their um, uh, relations, positive or negative? And, um, and as I've shown in the book, the history, the evidence, the empirical evidence does not support that. Delighted to end on a somewhat positive note and uh, so grateful for your expertise. Uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, actually rather than just virtually uh, on a, another visit further down the road when we have, uh, we have time to actually look at what has happened in this window that you mentioned of a week to or a month or so. Um, and we're really grateful that, uh, that you're here to share, share your expertise. Um, so we will wind it up for today. Thank all of you also for coming to hear Dr. Trita Parsi talk about this important, urgent um, issue. And um, with that, we look forward to seeing you at additional events sponsored by the International Scene Lecture Series and the Institute for Peace Studies, as well as the, the many events of the Cultural Center. Um, so again, thanks to all of you. Stay safe, stay sane, stay smart stay warm these days. Thanks again. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.